it's ultimately it's a large metagame and you're, you're competing against some of the smartest people in the world and, and that's what really can make it rewarding and extremely frustrating too because there's enormous amounts of capital both financial and brain power that you're up against this is net learnings the podcast that keeps finance and banking professionals ahead of the curve In each episode, we focus on career growth and practical advice while mixing in the occasional war story. Join us as we tap into the minds of leaders and experts at some of the world's most notable financial services firms and enterprises. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Net Learnings. I'm your host, Kyle Peterty. Our guest today is Robert Polkies, Senior Vice President, Trade Execution, at Waratah Capital Advisors, a Toronto-based hedge fund. Rob has over 15 years of capital markets, asset management, and sales and trading experience. Prior to joining Waratah in 2013, he had stops at several other high-profile firms, including High Street Asset Management and Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. It's our pleasure today to host Rob and to try and download a fraction of the wisdom he's earned over the course of his career. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kyle. Just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed by our guests today are his own. They do not reflect those of his firm. Further, nothing discussed in this interview should be interpreted as trading or investing advice. This podcast format is intended for educational purposes. Now, Rob, by way of background, members of the CFI community work in a very wide variety of finance, banking, accounting, consulting, and leadership roles, among others. But whatever it is they're doing, I feel like everyone sort of secretly wishes they were a trader. So I'm especially excited today to talk about your experience as a professional one. Maybe we can start by zooming out for a minute. How should people think about the differences and the similarities between a traditional asset manager and a hedge fund? So we are uh, predominantly an equity long short investor hedge fund versus a traditional equity asset manager. Those guys would say have $100 worth of capital. And they probably deploy, you know, 95, 90, 97% of that into equities, leave a little bit of a cash buffer. Us, on the other hand, we can use leverage. So we, we'll go bigger than a, that $100. So we'll employ leverage. And then the big difference is we, we will short stocks. So we'll take bets against stocks as well, which a traditional equity asset manager probably won't do. And I think there's some nuance around regulation as well and, and, and marketing and things of that nature. Absolutely. It's very strict. Most of our clients will be accredited investors and there's a much higher threshold. We'll love to pull on this thread a little more. Maybe we can talk kind of in general terms about the institutional equity landscape broadly. Like, can you kind of break down what makes up the buy side and the sell side? We, we hear these terms a lot and, and sort of how they interact with each other. Sure, the buy side encompasses hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds. And the sell side would be the broker-dealer network whose primary job is uh, primary and secondary issuances of stock. And then within those, within the buy side, you typically have portfolio managers who'd be making decisions on investments. You'd have analysts supporting them. And then you'd have a trading team for when the rubber hits the road, you know, deploying that capital in the market. On the sell side, you'd have somewhat different roles. You'd have analysts researching stocks. You'd have traders doing the same thing I'm doing on the other side. And then you'd have an ECM group, which would be, you know, involved with, with corporates and, and raising capital. ECM being equity capital markets. Correct, yeah. At the risk of overgeneralizing, are there any kind of consistent themes in terms of roles across buy side versus sell side? And I'm thinking like easy to understand dimensions, like work-life balance, compensation, like how should people think about if they're making that decision at at that fork in the road? It's changed a lot. So when I started in the business, uh, call it 2007, the, the sell side had a lot more power. Commissions were higher. And what's, there's been a lot of changes in the broader backdrop. Uh, one would be not the flight, but the, the growth of passive investing. So ETFs and passive management with extremely low fees is eaten into some of the sell side margins, but also the buy side margins. So active management has been tougher. There's been a wave of consolidation on the buy side space, which has also helped drop fees. But pragmatically for your audience, I'd say buy side compensation has probably been trending higher and sell-side compensation has probably been going lower over the last 10, 20 years. I'd like to chat maybe a little bit about about hedge funds in general. 
obviously every firm's a little different, but I imagine there are people analyzing companies, there are people executing trades like you, there are there's a portfolio manager, compliance, and obviously there's folks going out and like finding new investment dollars and managing those investor relationships. Like how do you sort of break down the different functional areas within a hedge fund? Oh, sure. So the the cornerstone would be the investment team, again, portfolio managers, analysts, and traders. But then behind that, you have a massive support network. So traditionally, we'd have operations or back office, which would be making sure the trades get settled and, and the day-to-day functions are going smoothly. A lot of people like us would have a, a risk group, which is very conscious of you know basic risks like beta, but also exposures to factors and different different things. So you're not you know, quote unquote, blindsided by a risk that you didn't know you were taking. And then you would have a sales and marketing group, which would be supporting clients, talking to clients, as well as canvassing for new business. So sort of three major core divisions. Is one of them more of a natural entry point for people considering this as a, as a career? On the buy side, traditionally, a place like ours, we're looking to hire someone a few years out of school with a little bit of experience. And on the analyst portfolio management side, you're looking at consulting or investment banking would be natural places to come in. On the sell side, the banks uh, generally have big rotational programs, whether they'll be hiring at undergrad or MBA. And that could be into an investment banking role or into uh, like a sales and trading role. Those would be the natural entries. But buy side entry level is difficult. It's extremely competitive, certainly way more competitive than when I started. I was lucky to get in. You're being modest. <laughs> but um, yeah, but buy side's a tough, a tough nut to crack. Now, in terms of fund mechanics, let's sort of talk fund life cycle. Do most hedge funds raise capital in like a closed pool? Or are you taking on investors all the time on, a, on like a rolling basis? The closed capital is more of a private equity model. For you know most funds like us, it's on a, a rolling basis. And uh, you'd have uh, certain liquidity constraints on when you can get in and when, when you can get out. Well, that was my next question around sort of fund life cycle. When, when does it end? Like, or how could someone take capital out? There typically would be a notice period. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, it makes it easier for us to manage our positions. Hedge funds to manage positions. You know, I, I mentioned that oftentimes we are employing leverage. Mm-hmm. And the worst, worst case scenario for any levered fund would be, you know, investors kind of leaving all at once. And then it is usually in like a left tail type risk off environment. And then that kind of those fund flows would exacerbate themselves. Uh, you certainly saw some of that in like March 2020 in, in the GFC. These kind of things happen. So that's why there's generally uh, constraints. Well, we also saw that mass outflows of cash can be bad even for a traditional financial institution. A- absolutely. With, all the time. Yeah. With, and with interest rates where they are, too. You know, that's now competition. We used to say post GFC, there was an acronym TINA, which meant there is no alternative. I right, right. had to be in risk assets because rates on fixed income and cash were, were so low that, you know, people reach for return. And, and that's pretty common in, in that, el- that time in the cycle. Great insight. Do you want to play a game? Sure. All right. Sort of making this up as I go. So, so workshopping the name. And I'd love, I'd love to hear from our listeners if, uh, if they like this. But I'm, I'm thinking middle school money manager. Now it's a word game. I'm going to throw out an investing themed word and the the game is that you need to define it. But the catch of course, is that you have to pretend I'm in middle school. Just make it really, really easy. And in fact, if you followed my portfolio over the last few years, you might actually think I'm in middle school. So this may not be such a reach. Do you understand the rules? I'm good to go. Okay. ESG. That's an acronym for environmental, social and governance. And what that is trying to do is steer investors into taking into account some of the negative externalities. You know, there are, let's say there are issues with capitalism and one big one would be um, the problem with the discount rate. And what that means is very far in the future, the way financial modeling really works, it doesn't mean a lot in in the traditional finance apparatus, if you will. So ESG is is taking into account some of those externalities and, and bring them to the forefront of our consciousness. You know, that, that's things like climate change or, you know, easy stuff, low hanging fruit, like smoking, guns, anything where people thought maybe there was a, you know, a negative societal impact where um, it's not just about the bottom line. 
That makes sense. I, I don't know. I wish I went to your middle school. That was, uh, that was uh, yeah. First sorry, crack. I forgot we were doing guys. the middle the middle school version. That's okay. That's uh, okay. Well, we're practicing. I mean, my here. my kids are coming home telling me to save the polar bear, so it's obviously okay. Top of mind. Top of mind for them. All right. Next word, custodian. Okay. Oh, so the middle school version. The custodian is holding all our securities in cash. You know, it's an organization that safeguards that for us. What is a prime broker? Uh, a custodian that will also lend us money, lets us take leverage, and they'll also provide us the securities that we're shorting. We have to legally borrow them before we sell them. So that prime broker is engaged in that activity as well. What is... Oh, sorry, not middle school version again. Well, that was closer. What is a derivative? Derivative is a security that derives its value from an underlying asset, a different asset. Well, you definitely can't use the word in the definition of the word. <laughs> No, Let's try no, again. that's a tough one. Let's try again. Uh, middle school version. Oh, geez. I don't know, man. Pass. Okay. <laughs> pass. Let's look at some examples of derivatives. What is a put? Uh, the right to sell something. The right, but not the obligation. Correct. That's the, the B school, as I recall it. Yeah. And so easy version would be a stock's a hundred dollars. I might be worried it's going to go down. I could buy a put option, which I probably one of your questions for the right to sell it at $98. You know, maybe I was worried it would go down to, to 90 so that I'm protected from losses below 98. Okay. What is a call option? The opposite, the right to buy. And that's, this would be employed where, you know, maybe you thought a, a stock would go up so you, you could lock in the right to buy it at, at a certain price. Okay. One more, if you don't mind. What is Absolutely. a paired trade? Paired trade is a common in the hedge fund space and an easy example would be us um, buying $100 worth of say bank ABC in Canada let's just say it's BMO and we would take a bet against a bank like Royal Bank for instance so we short it on the other side $100 long $100 short and what you're trying to do is insulate yourself from some of the beta of the market and the return will simply be the difference between the two securities so I think I mentioned BMO long so if BMO goes down 10% and Royal Bank goes down 12%, you made that 2% and you kind of ignored the larger drawdown in the market, ideally. So it protects you against like broader market moves affecting an entire sector. When you pair, you're generally going to pair them to highly correlated securities, you know, one bank versus another. Right. And, and that should insulate you from some of that beta, that market, the market ups and downs. Well, that was, that was pretty good. Good explanations. We can practice uh, the middle school component later, but that was good. <laughs> Not my forte. That's okay. That was fun. Let's go in a different direction. I want to talk a bit about your role and, and sort of your career path. So first, what is a SVP trade execution actually responsible for? So I'm responsible for all the agency trading at the fund, agency meaning I'm doing it on behalf of someone. So the portfolio managers and those registered to buy and sell securities, it'll come through me. And at that point, more often than not, it's at my and my desk's discretion. We have called one and a half, and a, one and a half other traders, uh, one full-time and, and one backup. And we'll be responsible for, for the, how, that, how that gets done in the market. So what was the other part of the question? No, it was just what, what is your sort of responsibility? Oh. The follow-up question, which is maybe where you were going, is... To the extent that any two days are alike, you know, can you walk us through what a typical day looks like? They look a lot like from the top down level, but the nitty gritty changes all the time. And that's one of the best parts of this job. So a typical day would be starting around 730. We get in, we might have some overnight orders. We're predominantly North America. There might be some stuff in Asia or Europe going on. We might be dealing with, and we might have been dealing with that at night as well. So we'll, you know, keep an eye on the trading blotter there, what's happening. Then we're catching up on news. My team will, will write a morning note, which will be macro-based as well as company-specific things. A anything that, that's relevant to our portfolio managers on a short-term basis and long-term for that matter. And that'll be read by both the investment team as well as marketing. So you know they know what's going on when they're talking to our clients. And then after that, we, we're kind of getting ready for the open. At this point, you, you have economic data coming out often before the open as well as a lot of, you know, right now it's around earning seasons. So we're quite busy and our portfolio managers are probably, you know, going to start submitting trades before the open. And then it's up to us to strategize what we're going to do. And that becomes difficult 
again, especially in earnings or volatile markets, and we'll have a little bit of time to plan before the open. So we, we could be trading uh, right off the we're likely trading right off the hop at 9.30 until 4. And then over the course of the day, it's dynamic. The busiest parts of the day are right around the open and right around the close mm -hmm. where there's a lot of volume. The open is the harder part to trade because spreads and volatility are at their widest. This is because the market is, is pricing in new information. Again, economic data, idiosyncratic company data. So the market really has to find a level. So that takes it, that, that takes a lot of work and it's probably the most uh, tricky time to trade. Things usually slow down around lunch. There's kind of a lull in volume before it picks up in at the end of the day. And then the end of the day um, is a more ideal time generally to trade where transaction costs and our impact on any stocks will will be diminished and okay. stocks kind of find a level. But, you know, wild things happen at the end of the day too. End of the day, you know, we do some administrative stuff and then, you know, it's, it's kind of on to the next one, on okay. to the next day. It sounds incredibly interesting. Like, do you find it invigorating? Do you find it stressful? Both? Maybe another adjective that I'm missing? Both, for yeah. sure. Invigorating because no problem's really the same. The market's different day to day. You know, one day you're worried about regional bank contagion. The next day you're worried about inflation prints. And you know, it's not all negative stuff. There could be lots of positive stuff going on. There are... A lot of new dynamics in the market, especially in the last few years, where derivatives are probably playing a, a bigger impact on on intraday moves. So the ground is is ever changing, and that's what makes it kind of fun. It's a puzzle that never really ends for for both portfolio managers and traders. And for which you don't have a, a picture on the box either, I'm sure. What's that? It's a puzzle for which you do you do oh. not have a picture. You're sort of charting no, your own and, course and people every day. people are stealing your pieces and. <laughs> pieces are going missing and you know they don't fit but but you know it's ultimately also you know it's a large metagame and you're, you're competing against some of the smartest people in the world and, and that's what really can make it rewarding and extremely frustrating too because there's enormous amounts of capital both you know financial and brain power that you're up against but you know there are different time horizons and different goals for investors so a lot of us can coexist in the ecosystem but it's certainly, you know, as competitive as ever. And then the, mar the market has new dynamics too, where especially since the post-GFC, uh, central banks have played a bigger role and arguably, you know, company fundamentals like in the, in the days of Fisher and Buffett are, are, are different and markets are more efficient. So extracting that, that, that alpha that we're all seeking uh, yeah, is a never-ending challenge. That's great analysis and, and good analogy. So Rob, what are two or three absolute must-have skills for someone in the sales and trading game? Absolute must-have skills. Passion is one. You do end up kind of living and breathing what you're doing. And if you're only you know tangentially interested or you got into it because your professor or your dad or, or someone pushed you into it and said, you know, maybe you do okay, you'll, you'll make a good living here, but, but you don't love it, yeah, you probably won't last that long. Another big one would be communication, especially on the trading side, you know, not being totally clear what you're trying to accomplish, your intentions or instructions can lead to, you know, bad outcomes. And like that communication for me, it's internally too. So I'm talking to portfolio managers, analysts, trying to get their thoughts and then apply that to, to our trade strategies. And then, so I have to communicate, you know, internally, and then I have to communicate externally when I'm using the sales trader or talking to a liability trader who might be using a bank's balance sheet to help us. And that communication to the other side of the street is imperative as well. As traders, the, the motto of the Security Traders Association is my word is my bond and our reputations matter a lot, especially when we're using other people's capital to trade, which, which happens quite regularly. So that, that two-way internally and externally is paramount. And then Finally, a detail orientation is pretty important as well. I'm much like a pilot or any, anywhere else. I'm not suggesting that uh, we have people's lives at stake, but we're safeguarding their capital. And it could be a pension, some guy working somewhere is, you know, saving for retirement could be, you know, a number of different investors and they're relying on that, that money to be there for them. So not making mistakes and, and being diligent is, goes without saying is very important. Passion, communication, and detail oriented. Those are three very important skills. And, and, you know, you touched on something when you were talking about passion 
And that was the, the level of commitment that's required. So how do you think about you know, work-life balance? That's part one. Part two, maybe, do you have any advice or strategies for our listeners around how they might tackle that same sort of issue in their roles? So it, it does depend on your functional role within the organ, like what kind of business you're in. So investment banking, as you know, I'm sure your, uh, your clientele is aware, you know, carries long hours and, and very poor work, work-life balance. And that's kind of part of the, the structure and the hierarchy over there. Portfolio managers and analysts, it comes in waves for sure. During earnings season, especially they're busy, you know, they're up, mm-hmm. they're up at night, they're pouring through, they might have four companies hit after the close and they got a lot of work to do before market open to ascertain, you know, what's important and what's not. So that, that does move around. Sales and trading can be a little bit better. Certainly, I, I don't work any anything like investment banking hours. It's something that attracted uh, me to this, and I'm, I'm sure we can get in how I ended up here to begin with. So it does vary by role. When I started uh, my career, I was at Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. And at the time, I'm not sure if they've changed it, we were trading globally from one desk in Toronto. So certainly... There were some late nights here and there, but that goes with the territory. So that can be detrimental to sleep and and family life sometimes, but hopefully it's not all the time and, uh, you know, a proper organization will will structure that appropriately. You sort of touched on this. What was it that led you to the buy side versus the sell side? Was it work-life balance part of it? I was lucky enough. So I started in the business. I went to Laurier. I went through the co-op program, which I would highly recommend. And my first job in finance was on a securities lending trading desk. So that would technically be on, on the sell side. You know, those are the guys who at the prime broker are lending us those securities and, and they, they're making a market in that too, in that lending market. So they're, they're charging us basically a fee to take those securities. And while it's not trading per se, it was, you know, it's kind of a trading desk type atmosphere. And I was pretty attracted to that. And I was lucky enough to get another co-op job at Ontario Teachers on the equity trading desk. And I kind of, you know, I was there for a couple of weeks and I kind of said, this is for me. You know, I was, I was dealing with people similar. They were like me a lot. And, you know, there was, a, it was kind of a fun atmosphere, you know, a lot like sports where it's intense, but you know, everyone can kick back and have a good time as well. But so I ended up kind of naturally on the buy side. I did have points in my career where I thought I would flip it, maybe it was to try something new. Maybe it was, you know, kind of inertia and I should move, maybe move on to something else. I'm kind of glad I didn't. The sell side has been contracting, generally speaking, over my whole career. And the buy side, I did mention earlier, has a little bit more power. And by that, I mean, on the trading side, a couple decades ago, a buy side trader was more, it was more of like an admin role. You were just, you were just giving trades to brokers and, and taking reports and that was it. But there was a number of changes and a lot of that had to do with electronic trading where the buy side was empowered with tools to almost take on a sell side role. And we could trade a lot of a lot of the securities ourselves through some computer networks that would mimic what they were doing as well as access to their algorithms and, and, diff, and uh, direct market access. So we could skip the human if need be uh, where appropriate. That's interesting insight. And, and I actually was hoping to be able to ask you something about skipping the human, and you've dovetailed nicely into that, generative AI. So we're recording this in, call it Q223, and it's taken the world completely by storm. Like, What are your thoughts on this and how it may or may not sort of impact the sales and trading world? Has this been going on already for a long time and it's just coming to the public's view? Like, wh- Where's your head on generative AI? Right now, I suppose the AI stuff that we've seen in the last several years in our business has been, I guess a lot of AI is probably just, and machine learning is kind of fancy regression. And the tools we have allow us to do more with less. So we, we uh, generally have higher turnover than your regular asset manager. And with two full-time traders, we can do a lot. And that's been the case for a while, but I've likened it to, to a pilot who's sitting in the cockpit, like you want the pilot there generally, he's got to keep an, a watch on everything and, and systems aren't perfect. And the plane can kind of fly by itself. You probably don't don't want to do that all the time. I'm not saying I'm just kicking back, eating cookies, you know, with the co-pilot. But, you know, you, that's a hard question. Certainly with ChatGPT and some of the things we're starting to see, we're starting to get a glimpse that 
AI breakthroughs won't be linear. And right. we could be in for some serious societal level changes. And may, maybe we're on the cusp of that. How that impacts us, I'm not totally sure. It remains to be seen. I guess the likely scenario if you know if, if we keep progressing like this in AI is that markets be even more efficient. But then again, markets are often driven by human behavior, so right. You know, your buddy trading on Robinhood is probably not going to be trading through AI and, you know, he'll make his own investment decisions and there will be kind of anomalous relationships that are out there for asset managers to look at. But yeah, I, there's pure speculation here. It, it's going to, if it changes us, you know, society is also changing with it and what that looks like, uh, I guess, remains to be seen. For sure. Great insight. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, you finished your undergraduate program around 2007, I think. Is that right? 06. And then 06. I went, yeah, I went back to teachers briefly. And then I went traveling, which I'd highly recommend. I did Southeast Asia and Australia, New Zealand. And, nice. and then I came back kind of, you know, ready to start my career. Just and, in time uh, for a recession. Uh, yeah, I started uh, late 07. And uh, yeah, not just uh, any recession, the Great Recession and, you know, volatility like we haven't seen since the 1930s and I was fresh and I was kind of watching it with fresh eyes it was new for a lot of people you know having seen massive financial institutions collapse I, I think what helped me was I didn't have any kind of preconceived notions on on how you should trade such a high volatility environment so I, I, I did learn a lot as I went along and then of course we get March 2020 where, where the volatility was actually more extreme and I was like oh I, I've been here before so that's it's been a ride, yep. Yeah. No, that's interesting that you would think coming in with, with no experience would be a major disadvantage, but you're saying kind of clear eyes, fresh eyes might have helped you learn uh, as opposed to having an idea about what's going to happen next because you've, you know, quote unquote, seen it before. Yeah, not not to bore you with it, but at the same time, there were massive changes within, call it market microstructure, where before exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ had they'd trade maybe 80% of their volume on the primary exchange. And you, you saw the regulators trying to promote competition. So you had a number of different exchanges and venues pop up. And these, some of these electronic tools I talked about were brand new around that time, almost brand new. So my boss at Teachers was pretty progressive in the, in the sense, and she had been buy side, sell side for a couple of decades, and, and she was open to the new tools. So we were lucky to have a, you know, that kind of toolkit an ability to bob and weave and let the new technology help us out a lot. And, and it certainly, it certainly did. Dark pools were new and dark pools would be basically a way to transact without a pre-trade information leakage where, you know, we could have a, there could be a buyer of 50,000 shares and buyer, uh, pardon me, a seller of a hundred thousand shares. And, and we could meet within an electronic network without the information leakage that sometimes comes with transacting through humans. And those tools were picking up in steam, you know, pretty aggressively there and being at kind of the forefront of that was made my job easier for sure. It's and exciting too, I'm sure. You, you mentioned your, your boss at Teachers and it got me thinking, I'm a big believer in mentorship as a means of kind of improving people's professional outcomes and, and personal ones. Like I know I asked for a lot of coffees and, and had some great bosses along my career too. I'm curious, did you have any mentors along the way that, that really helped you in your career journey? Yep. Yeah, so my boss teacher's name was Sally. Her name is Sally Fulton. She was big for me and she retired actually uh, midway through 2008, right, right before the proverbial, you know, poop hit the fan. So she was always around for me to chat. And then I had another important mentor who was on, on the sell side who, you know, you know, I still talk to regularly and, and he was helpful. Like when you're, when you're in this new role, I didn't, I didn't find that I was comfortable in it because of the nature of the job for probably two, three, four years where you've seen enough iterations of the same thing over and over. With trading early on, you, it, it can be very stressful when you're, when you're unsure what to do. And then after time, you kind of develop a, your own decision tree and, and it becomes a little more automatic. But early on, you know, there's an enormous amount of stress when you're saying, do I do A or B or C or D or E or F? And, and you know, once you can get past that, I think you make better decisions and, and, you're a little more mindful of what you're doing. Keen to hear your advice. A lot of listeners are going to be in the sort of front half of their careers. Are there any authors, maybe a specific book, a thought leader, other resources that, that you recommend to folks interested in capital markets or sales and trading? 
Uh, the first book I would recommend is not finance related, but it's it's related to your place within an organization, and it's called uh, Power: Why Some Have It and Others Don't. And okay. the guy's name is escaping me right now, but he's I think he's a professor still at Stanford. And for anyone who thinks that if they get into an organization and they're going to put their head down and work really hard and just kind of sit in the corner and they'll be really successful, that may not be true. You know, an organization is composed of people and you, you are always selling yourself as well internally. So that is a must read. If a co-op asks me for a book here, that's the first one I say. Okay. There's lots of finance books to find. Um, the best one for anyone interested in trading I found recently is um, it's called Alpha Trader by a guy named Brent Donnelly, actually a Canadian guy who's had a number of mostly sell side roles. And he aggregated the research in the best way I've seen where, you know, you've heard of Annie Duke thinking in bets. There's another guy he cites in there, John Wolf, which is, who's done research on, or pardon me, John Coates. He's done research on the biology of risk taking. You know, if you're familiar with uh, how hormones like cortisol can suddenly kick up, you know, that that's, you know, as important for, for people trading as, you know, macroeconomic analysis. And he, he consolidated it in, in a way I've never seen. So, you know, maybe it's, it might be a four or 500 page read, but it's the most dense book I've seen for anyone, you know, aspiring to do this. And Brent also has a, I believe he's got a free email list for, for students and new people getting into this to, to, to help them along. Beyond that, yeah, those would be the two big ones for me. Thanks for that. We're going to put those in the show notes for our listeners that are interested in checking that out. Rob, this has been really, really insightful. If if people want to learn more about about you or about Waratah, where should they go? Sure. We have a, a website, Waratah Advisors. That's awesome. I want to be respectful of your time. One more question, if I may. I'd like to ask all of our guests this. If If you weren't a trader, what would you be doing? Oh, my wife would laugh at this. When I was 17, I joined the Army Reserve and thought I might have a career in the military. And you know, maybe maybe I would, I would have stuck with that. It would have been a different lifestyle for sure. But, you know, some of us are drawn to it. So I probably would have done that. Would have uh, demanded a similar level of rigor and discipline, I suspect, to what you're doing currently. So that's sort of an interesting parallel. Rob, thanks for sharing. Again, really, really appreciate your time. All the best. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks very much for having me, and I hope everyone gets some some use out of this. Thanks for listening to this episode of Net Learnings. This podcast is powered by CFI, an organization on a mission to enhance the skills, knowledge, and productivity of finance and banking professionals. If you enjoyed what you heard in this episode, make sure to follow Net Learnings wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, or visit us online at corporatefinanceinstitute.com slash podcast. See you next time.